I'm such an awesome guy, I make so many videos. Brum. Hello there, Price of Reason here with a series review. In February 2021, when it was announced that Mindy Kaling would be writing and producing Velma, a Scooby-Doo prequel of sorts, many people had reservations about it, myself included. Still, while it was pretty obvious that the show would be one of those reimagined, modern-day updates that included a bunch of Hollywood propaganda, I don't think anybody had been fully prepared for the amount of messaging we ended up getting in Velma Season 1, as well as just how little Mindy Kaling would respect the actual source material. For those who don't remember the first season of Velma, which was was meant to serve as an origin story for the gang of teenagers from Scooby-Doo, it presented their leader Fred as a dumb, ignorant, self-entitled, privileged, white male, Easton phobe for some reason. Shaggy didn't look or act anything like Shaggy at all, and he was mainly there to act as some type of beta male simp for Velma. Daphne, whose adopted mothers were an LG policewoman couple, was actually in love with Velma, and Velma hated women that looked good. Oh, and there was some type of nonsensical murder mystery in the background, which stretched across several episodes and ended up being a convoluted pile of crap. And it's not like the show was well received or anything. The amount of hate this show ended up getting from pretty much everybody easily cemented cemented it as one of the worst shows of all time. And while Velma Season 1 was neither popular nor successful, beyond any traditional logic, it still received a second season. One of the reasons for this is because animated shows are often greenlit for two seasons right from the start due to the costs and logistics associated with putting together an animated production, especially when there's a high-profile cast involved. So basically, it's pretty obvious that while Season 1 of Velma was a complete and utter disaster for Warner Brothers, since they'd already paid for it, they pretty much had no choice but to let Season 2 air. In that sense, it's a situation that's a bit similar to Netflix and Kevin Smith's very unpopular He-Man sequel series. And it's also quite telling that as opposed to Velma's Season 1, which was gradually released over a five-week window, with Season 2, all of the episodes were dumped on Max on the same day, which is likely a sign of low confidence from the streamer. Also, Season 2 didn't get the same aggressive marketing push that the first season did, as though even Warner Brothers themselves were embarrassed to release it and just wanted to get it over with. It also didn't help them that not only did Mindy Kaling refuse to course correct the creative direction of the series, but instead for season two, she actually ended up doubling down on its over-the-top modern-day agenda. In this video, I will discuss the general plot for Velma season two, what I didn't like about it, what I especially didn't like about it, followed by my official score. Velma season two picks up where the first season leaves off. In the aftermath of Fred's mother's death and learning that she's a serial killer, not Shaggy believes that Fred's mother's ghost is haunting him. In addition, there's a new series of murders where male figures of authority are found dead with their Johnsons missing. I said we cut off your Johnson! Not that this is a shock or anything. I mean, at this point, I would be surprised if their Johnsons weren't missing. Anyhow, Velma wants to solve the mystery, but her mother, who's now back in her life, wants her to stay out of trouble. But Velma's mother quickly becomes preoccupied as she has an affair with Velma's teacher and then becomes romantically involved with Fred's newly widowed father. Velma's father continues to to be a loser who got his mistress pregnant but refuses to marry her. And Velma herself is now in a romantic relationship with Daphne, which gets tested when a gender-neutral student shows up using they-them pronouns, and then a love triangle of sorts develops. Yes, this really happens and it's actually a thing on the show. Also, since the sheriff is dead, Daphne's adoptive policewoman mother-lover partners want to replace him and become the new sheriffs. Throughout the season, it also turns out that not Shaggy's scientist grandmother is still alive and she's secretly trying to put the brains of dead teenage girls from season one back into their bodies or something. But the worst development of this season ultimately has to be the introduction of Scrappy-Doo. On the original show, Scrappy was Scooby-Doo's nephew who would often join Shaggy and Scooby as they investigated mysteries. On this show, though, it turns out that Scrappy-Doo is the serial killer that Velma was looking for all along, and after exposing him for all the murders that he committed, Velma ends up killing him. In a final twist, it turns out that Velma is dead and has now become a ghost. And it would genuinely surprise me if we ever got a resolution to this dumb cliffhanger, but I'm perfectly fine with that. Let's start with what I didn't like about Velma Season 2. Much like Season 1, this show doesn't honor its franchise in any way, shape, or form, as it continues 
continues to play out like a social justice warrior's fever dream. It never aims to tell any type of cohesive story, and the actual mystery here is pretty much a nonsensical and irrelevant afterthought. But beyond the show's on-the-nose agenda peddling, its worst offense is that it wants you to think it's a comedy, but it's actually not funny at all. And it's not for a lack of trying. Much like Family Guy, this show tries to squeeze in so many jokes into every scene, hoping that at least a few will generate some laughs, but it fails miserably. And while I'm not a huge Family Guy fan myself, even I admit that at least some of Seth MacFarlane's jokes are mildly amusing. With Velma, Mindy Kaling's approach is so mean-spirited and socially preachy that ultimately, none of her jokes ever land, if you can even call them that. And that's really the biggest problem of this entire series. As I've said in the past, this show feels like some type of therapy session for Mindy Kaling, who with the net worth of $45 million feels like she's a victim of the patriarchy and she desperately wants you to know about it. And if you didn't have access to Google, you'd probably think that for Kaling's whole life, people have kept her and her family down. But it turns out that her parents were both successful and well-off professionals and that growing up, they had sent her to all of the best and most expensive schools. Nevertheless, if you happen to be a straight white male, well, then you better apologize to Mindy because she's very upset. And the part that's the most frustrating here is if Mindy Kaling really wanted a vehicle to air all of her perceived grievances, why did she have to use this franchise to do it? She could have just made a series called Little Mindy and have her character hate men and lecture people as much as she wanted. But then again, since that show would have likely been a more difficult sell, she decided to hijack an already existing IP like Scooby-Doo instead, and a pre-David Zaslav Warner Brothers let her do it for some reason. The problem is that prior to Mindy Kaling's Velma series, Scooby-Doo has always been a fun, wholesome, family-friendly piece of pop culture entertainment. Throughout its many different reincarnations, people have generally responded well to it. If there had been a genuine effort to bring it back for a legitimate series from this franchise, and it had actually stayed true to its past, I think it would have had a lot of potential, and a lot of people probably would have been interested in seeing it. Instead, we got a show that's obsessed with the LG love life of teens and a talking dog that's actually a serial killer. And who asked for this? Nobody. And that's who the show was ultimately for. Absolutely nobody. And you know what? I know that Mindy Kaling isn't going to ever have any financial issues or anything, but I genuinely hope that she's never given another opportunity to write and produce a show like this again, because I think what she's done with Velma is simply inexcusable. In years to come, as we hopefully look back at this dark time in entertainment, Velma will likely be just one of many prime examples for how the woke era destroyed an entire industry and how not to treat a popular IP. Now, I assume that at least some of you are curious as to what score I've given Velma Season 2, and it may surprise you to learn that I actually had a hard time with this one. On the one hand, I usually try to find at least something the show gets right to give even a few points on, even if I don't like what I'm seeing. But no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't say anything good about this show. I know that some animators put in some work into it, and I genuinely feel bad for them, but this show is practically unwatchable. In fact, if I hadn't decided to do a review about it, I think I would have turned it off after one episode. Season 1 was terrible in and of itself, yet Season 2 somehow succeeds in being much worse if that was even possible. Therefore, I have no choice but to give Velma Season 2 a score of 0 out of 100, which would be the lowest score that I've ever given on this channel. And that's because this show is a complete and utter disgrace, and it has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. I wouldn't recommend this trash, dumpster fire of a show to anybody, as it is one of the worst things that I've ever seen on screen, ever. On the bright side though, please like, subscribe, and follow my channel, as your support really helps, and it's always greatly appreciated. Thanks for watching, my friends. Thank you, and good day. I am such an awesome guy. I make so many videos. Brum.